Hello and welcome to one of a series of chats with Cricket Society committee members where I'll have a chance to talk to the people who make the society tick about their cricketing lives and today I'm talking to Raf Nicholson. Hi Raf. Hi Jeff. Dr Raf Nicholson is a committee member of the Cricket Society as well as being the chair of the British Society of Sports History. She's one of the UK's leading cricket journalists who's covered the women's game for national newspapers and specialist cricket magazines and websites as well as via her own website, crickether.com, which has news and comments on all the latest developments in women's cricket. She has also written for Wisdom for the Almanac, with the 2020 edition carrying her profile of Cricketer of the Year, Elise Perry. As well as her journalistic work, Raf is an academic whose latest book, Ladies and Lords, is a history of women's cricket in Britain. Raf, we've known each other for a while now through the BSSH, but for those of us who don't know what it is, what is the BSSH? Uh, BSSH stands for the British Society of Sports History. Um, so we've got a few hundred members um, and our members are largely UK based, although we do have members from around the world. Um, we run an annual conference and we have a journal, Sport in History. Um, and um, yeah, we're here to kind of promote the study of the history of sport, I suppose, in all its different guises. Um, I think most of our members are academics, it's fair to say, but we do have non-academic members as well. So generally we're kind of open for anyone who's interested in the history of sport. Yeah, and we put on events and we're happy for people who are not members to watch those events online, which we'll be doing over the next uh, week or two and then through the rest of the year as well. So. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and was it via the BSSH that you first became interested in the Cricket Society or was it the other way around? Um, not really actually, I suppose very indirectly. So I was doing my PhD um, and that was focusing on the history of women's cricket, um, which is how I came to do all this kind of academic and non-academic writing about the history of women's cricket. So I was doing my PhD and I got invited along to um, a seminar at De Montfort University in Leicester. Um, and I was talking about my PhD research and also at this particular seminar was Nigel Hancock um, who's the current chair of the Cricket Society. Our esteemed leader. <laughs> Our esteemed leader indeed and um, so at that point I think he was considering doing some PhD research um, or some kind of um, academic study into cricket history. I'm not quite sure where he's at with that at the moment um, but that was why he was at this event. He had a kind of connection with De Montfort and um, somebody introduced us because obviously we're both interested in cricket history and um, Nigel did his usual thing he, I think he's very very good at this which is perhaps one of the reasons why he's current chairman of the Cricket Society he was very evan evangelical about the society and he said you know oh um, you should become a member if you love cricket um, then we run events and you'll be interested in some of our publications and things like that um, and I said, oh, I'll think about it. It's nice to meet you, Nigel. And I went home um, and I was living with my mum and dad at this time when I was doing my PhD. And I was having a chat to my dad. And I said, oh, I met Nigel Hancock, the chairman of the Cricket Society today. And he asked me to become a member. And my dad said, oh, I used to be a member of the Cricket Society. <laughs> Probably about, I don't know, 20 or 30 years before that. Um, and it turned out that dad had, had been a member once upon a time and had been to various meetings and um, had kind of enjoyed being a member but had sort of fallen out with it. Um, not fallen out with it, that implies he had a big conflict with the Cricket Society. Um, I think having four young children in quick succession put paid to um, that kind of leisure activity. Um, so he'd sort of fallen away from it is what I really mean. Um, and so at that point we both sort of said to each other, oh well let's both become members. Um, and the Cricket Society has got this thing where you can do a family membership. Um, so if two, fam two or more family members are living together, then you can pay less for your, for your membership. Um, so I think initially we signed up for one of those and then um, when I uh, moved out of mum and dad's house, um, I got my own membership. Um, so it kind of came about because of that really. So you can blame Nigel Hancock for all of this. Okay, <laughs> and now you're kind of firmly embedded in the cr cricket society <laughs> and kind of running events yourself. So recently you had a, an event with the former England captain Charlotte Edwards. How did that go? Yeah, it was really good actually. So it was one of the Zoom events that we've been holding um, during lockdown because obviously we haven't been able to meet up in person as a society. So I think that's really great that the society are doing that as a, as a kind of way for people to still feel connected as members of the society. Um, so I think um, according to um, 
Zoom numbers, we had over 100 people there, That's pretty good. Um, which is which is really great. And um, we had quite a few people there who aren't current members of the society because it was open to all. Um, so that was a really positive aspect of it because I think that um, one of the things that the society hasn't maybe done enough of is trying to reach out beyond its core membership mm. and beyond people who are um, interested in very traditional elements of cricket. Um, so kind of men's test cricket um, and actually try and appeal to people who are interested in different versions of cricket and interested in, in women's cricket. Um, and I thought that Charlotte Edwards was great as well. She was really engaging. Um, she was very honest in her answers um, and you know she's not kind of currently connected to the ECB so I think that she can speak quite openly about things that maybe a few years ago when she was a contracted England player she wouldn't have been able to speak about so openly um, and she's obviously a vice president of the society at the moment our first ever female vice president so it was good to be able to in a way sort of introduce her, introduce her to our members um, who maybe haven't kind of had that opportunity to interact with her before so yeah. overall I think it went really well. And that's that's online isn't it? That's on the society website now? Yes, um, I think if you go to latest news on the Cricket Society website then it's there as a Zoom recording and it's available for anyone to access so you don't have to be a member to access that recording. Yeah and do you see that as being um, much more part of the core of the society's activities now is like bringing in uh, more more aspects of the women's game um, yeah. in the future. Do you have anything in the pipeline around that? Or, I, mean, I shouldn't just put it on you as the, <laughs> as the woman on the committee. We should all be seeking to promote the game. I don't think we've got anything official lined up because I think that um, to some extent COVID has made things a little bit uncertain in terms of planning for future events. Um, but the aim certainly is to probably have at least one or two events a year focusing on women's cricket going forward. Um, and I think that there's definitely space for that and that the Zoom event has shown that there's real interest mm. and that it's a good way to attract, as I say, potentially new members to the society. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that the Charlotte Edwards Q&A is kind of the start of, of more similar events to come. Me too. Um, so I mentioned your book, uh, Lords and Ladies, and it's a real breakthrough in telling the history of the women's game in, in this country. So how did you come to take it on as a project? You mentioned your PhD earlier on. Yeah, well, I've been researching women's cricket history, um, well, actually, since about 2008, so it's over 10 years now. Um, I did my undergraduate thesis. Um, I studied history at Oxford, um, so I did my undergraduate thesis on the history of women's cricket, uh, and then I did a master's, and then um, my PhD thesis was all about the history of women's cricket. Um, and then um, the book that you mentioned, Ladies and Lords, um, has come out recently, and that is largely the product of research I did during my PhD. And I was kind of thinking about this. I think, ironically, it would be a lot easier to, to, to do that research now because at the time I was doing it, um, I was having to kind of dig out uh, primary source material and archival material that now is, um, is mainly um, located at the Lords, the MTC Library at Lords. Um, but a few years ago, it was kind of scattered around in people's spare rooms and attics and garages and a cow shed in Lancashire. Um, and um, so it was very much a kind of um, digging around to see what was out there. And I didn't realise what was there. Um, so that was quite exciting and doing loads of interviews with um, kind of some current England players, but a lot of former England players as well who aren't very well known and having them tell their stories. Um, so, yeah, it's the kind of the book is a sort of product of over a decade of research into the history of women's cricket. Yeah, well, the fact that the archive is coming together at the MCC is partly, partly due to your, your research, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think there's generally a lot more interest recently. Um, and I think partly what's happened is that a few years ago, there were slightly less progressive people at the MCC who, when um, some of these women cricketers came along and really? said... <laughs> <laughs> I know, you would never believe it, would you? Um, when some of these women cricketers came along, somebody like Enid Bakewell actually said to Lords a few years ago, please, here's some stuff I'd like to deposit it. And they said, no, we don't really have room and we're not really interested in women's cricket. Um, and so, and now the attitude's completely transformed, and they're really excited about this new collection, and they've got all these archi all this archival material there, as I say. So, yeah, hopefully, um, my research has helped stimulate a bit of interest in the women's game. And how do you manage to balance your work as a journalist with your work as an academic? Because it <laughs> seems incredibly. Uh 
busy. <laughs> um, with difficulty is the short answer. The longer answer is that um, I currently work at Bournemouth University and they've been really supportive of my, um, of my kind of more popular, more journalism side of my writing um, and have kind of given me time to, to focus on that. I think they see that as valuable. Um, we have something now in higher education called Impact, um, which is actually partly how universities are assessed. So they like it when people are doing stuff that has a kind of real world effect. And I think that my stuff um, tends to engage the public a bit more than some of some other stuff, perhaps. Um, so, so yeah, Bournemouth really supportive. Um, the other thing is that the cricket season coincides with um, the kind of long academic summer when the students aren't there, when I'm not having to do teaching. Mm. Um, so that's that's helped a bit in terms of trying to juggle the two things. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping that I can carry on with both of them because I think that they complement each other really well. Yeah, um, I've been asking people what their golden sporting ticket would be. Uh, you were lucky enough to cover uh, probably your golden sporting ticket, weren't you? Um, just before lockdown, can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, it's become kind of infamous now as the last big sporting moment before lockdown. I think it was um, literally a week before Australia went into lockdown. It was at the Melbourne Cricket Ground, the MCG, and it was the final of the Women's T20 World Cup that was held out in Australia. Um, so it was in March this year, and it was the most incredible event, actually. And I do remember a few days before, somebody came into the press box and it was the semi-finals of the tournament and they said oh the Australian government are sat down at the moment having a meeting to decide whether the final can still go ahead because they knew it was going to be a big crowd um, and we all kind of looked at each other really baffled like what's all the fuss about it was really <laughs> that was how quickly the world changed it really yeah. did feel like it happened within the space of a few days and then fortunately um, the Australian government decided it could go ahead so it did go ahead and we had 86,000 people at this That's event. Amazing. An absolute kind of record day and record crowd for the women's game. Um, the actual match itself was um, maybe not the best that you'll see in terms of Australia totally overwhelmed India, but obviously the home crowds um, lapped that up as, as they tend to do in Australia. Um, and then we had Katy Perry performing with these, um, it, she had dancers who were dressed as cricket bats, <laughs> as, as kind of pink and purple cricket bats. So it was very Katy Perry and very cricket simultaneously. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was an amazing day and not one I'll forget in a hurry. And uh, what are you looking forward to over the next year of cricket? Is there, what's, what's coming up in the women's game? Well, yeah, I mean, if you'd asked me that a few weeks ago, I would have said, well, the Women's 50 Over World Cup yeah. in February 2021 in New Zealand. But the ICC, um, in their wisdom, have decided that they're going to postpone that by a year. Um, so it's actually a really difficult question to answer because in terms of the calendar, there's actually very little um, for women's cricket coming up in the next few months. Um, so I guess I'd probably have to say the Rachel Hayhoe Flint Trophy, which is the kind of one-off domestic competition that's been thrown together at the last minute for this 2020 English season, and that's happening over the next few weeks, so during September. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping to be able to get to some of those matches and cover them as a journalist. They are happening behind closed doors, so we won't have crowds, unfortunately. Um, but they should be good, and I think it's great that the ECB have kind of put the resources in to making that happen. Well, thanks for chatting today, Raf. And uh, to keep up with Raf's cricket writing, you can go to her website at crickether.com or you can follow her on Twitter at Raf Nicholson. Uh, but thanks for uh, coming along today. Thanks very much, Jeff.